Uh, moving along quickly here, I want to uh, introduce the first panelist, if they would please come forward. And in doing that, I'm going to introduce the moderator, and he will uh, proceed to introduce the uh, uh, panelists. Uh, Dr. Robert Anderson is the president of uh, SHIHO, uh, the National Association of Chief Executives of, of Statewide Governing Policy and Coordinating Boards of Post-Secondary Education. Uh, go ahead and uh, join us, please, uh, and the panelists, too. Um, and prior to his position at SHIHO, uh, Dr. Anderson was Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs and Policy at the University uh, System of Georgia. He also held senior positions in education commissions, uh, both uh, West Virginia and Tennessee. So, uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, take it away and introduce your panel and proceed. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of the panel, it's a pleasure to be here today. We, we can't be addressing a more important topic within higher education at this time in our history. Um, as was mentioned, the last reauthorization was a decade ago, and a lot has happened within the period of a decade, and it needs to be addressed in a very concerted and a very systematic manner. As the president of SHIO, um, Sometimes I feel like I'm herding cats when, you, when your association is the representatives for all the state higher education systems. There's quite a different political context in each of our 50 states, um, but we all can find some commonalities and some beliefs that we adhere to. And one of those is, is the increased education of our college students. Um, we have to get them through in a more cost-efficient, time-efficient manner. Uh, using uh, resources and, and policy um, mechanisms that we, that we know are proven to work. And in order to do this, there has to be this alignment between federal policy, state policy, accreditation, and we all have to be rowing in the same direction. So uh, with this, one of the uh, areas that is most important is that of accountability. If, if we're going to do right by our students, if we're going to give them the education we promise when we accept them, and we have this ethical and moral imperative to then educate them and see them through and across the finish line, how are the different entities going to be accountable for this process? And we have a wonderful panel here this morning to help with uh, this discussion. And so I have, I'll introduce our panelists. I have a few preset questions, and then um, after a few minutes, I will open it up for questions from the audience. So please be uh, thinking about what you might want to ask each of our panelists. So with that, uh, to, my immediately to my immediate left is uh, Tiffany Jones. Tiffany directs the higher education policy team at EdTrust, where she promotes legislation to improve access, affordability, and success for low-income students and students of color. Before that, Tiffany was at the Southern Education Foundation in Atlanta, where she worked with HBCUs and Hispanic-serving institutions to advance student success, engage in analysis of federal and state policies. And uh, after Tiffany, next uh, on, on our, uh, to, to my left is James Caval, who serves as the president of the Institute for College Access and Success, known as TECAS. He previously served as the deputy domestic uh, policy advisor at the White House under President um, Obama, where he worked on a range of issues related to economic opportunity. His work in higher education included initiatives to make college tuition more affordable, protect students from unaffordable loans, and help many more students graduate from college. And next to James is uh, Scott Jenkins, who serves as the strategy director for the Lumina Foundation. Scott uh, leads the development and advancement of the foundation's state policy agenda, aimed at reaching a 60% attainment goal across all of our states. Scott previously served as the education policy director to Michigan Governor John Engler and Indiana Governor Mitch Daniels, and he also served as a deputy assistant secretary within the U.S. Department of Education within the Bush administration. And last and certainly not least is uh, Betty Vanden Bosch, who serves as the chancellor of Purdue's University uh, Global, which, uh, whose content is focused almost entirely online and has a focus on career-oriented types of fields. Prior to becoming chancellor, she was president of Kaplan University, which was acquired by Purdue in 2018. And Betty spearheaded the development of the university's competency-based education model, known as ExcelTrack, which has been highly effective and which offers students a personalized learning experience that allows them to leverage their existing knowledge towards a degree. So with that, won't you please join me in welcoming our panelists. James, I would, I would like to start with you if I could. Um, you, you approach this from a unique lens of recently working within the Obama administration. Um, broadly speaking, 
Uh, what policies does the federal government have in place and at its disposal to ensure that institutions are in fact doing right by their students and how effective are these policies at promoting institutional accountability? Wow, well, you're kind of going for the whole thing in one bite there. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, um, first, let me say I'm really happy to be here. I used to uh, work for George Miller, have tremendous respect for him. Mr. McKean was subcommittee chairman when I was there, so this uh, panel has special meaning uh, for me. Um, the system of quality oversight, the federal government spends uh, between student loans and grants and tax credits provides something like $150 billion a year in support for higher education. Our whole higher education system spends something like $400 billion. So the system the federal government lays out is quite important as context for the whole um, system and what works. And we rely on historically something called the triad, which means the Department of Education is responsible for setting minimum standards for participation by institutions and overseeing uh, financial stability of those institutions. Uh, accreditors look at academic quality and look at improvement over time. And states authorize, legis authorize institutions um, to participate are responsible for consumer protection. Obviously, they have um, a quite a substantial role in the governance of public institutions, which enroll about two-thirds of students. Um, I think overall, I would give the system perhaps a C. I think we have seen um, some important rules that we have in place that have driven impact. Um, so the cohort default rate, for example, has uh, dramatically reduced the number of students who default on the student loans with all the negative consequences that that carries. Uh, we've seen more recently the gainful employment rule drive improvement in the value that students receive through career education programs. I think those are positive forces. Um, but there is uh, a lot left to be done. I don't know that we can feel confident, for example, that the accountability system would prevent another Corinthian or another ITT from failing and leaving tens of thousands of students with debts they can't afford. Um, we make student loans. Um, there's some 42 million people now with student loans. Most of them are um, much better off because of that investment. College is one of the best investments you can make. But we do see um, increasingly troubling signs of large numbers of people who are struggling to repay their loans. Mr. McKeon mentioned the number of students who owe more than they originally borrowed. We have a million students a year defaulting. And so I think it is important for the commission to pay attention to the riskiness of the investment of student loans and make sure that those investments are paying off for students. Uh, and and that, that's, a, that's a great point uh, with student loans. You know, we, we know that less than half of the new federal uh, student borrowers are able to put a dent in their principal balance within three years' time. Um, uh, and to, to what extent, um, you know, what, what, what I'm wondering now, Betty, and I'll, I'll start with you on this one. If anybody else wants to jump in, please feel free. Uh, serving in, in an institution, um, to what extent do colleges and universities uh, share and the responsibility for these low uh, repayment rates? And is there a role that the federal government can play to help try to shape uh, this process moving forward? Well, there's no question that institutions bear some of the burden. Obviously, we have to make sure that our students do as well as they possibly can while they are with us. And it's, uh, it's a fraught question because at, on the one hand, the best way to ensure that you won't have any defaults is not to let any students into your schools that need financial aid. Mm -hmm. That solves the problem immediately. Right. And of course, that's one extreme. The other extreme is open enrollment. Everybody gets a chance to try. When you have open enrollment and everyone gets a chance to try, you are taking on more risk as an institution. Now, institutions should participate, and certainly at Purdue, we believe that institutions should be responsible for a portion of those debts. The challenge is how do you make the trade-off? How do you determine which students and when and who you let in and who you limit? Another thing that's really relevant here is the degrees that students take on. Um, and I just want to draw an example between nurses and medical assistants. Both are absolutely crucial to the health of our society. One group 
has a much easier time paying back their loans than the other because societally one group makes a lot more money than the other. Those are the issues we have to, to struggle with as we determine how we can make sure that institutions don't choke access while ensuring that quality stays strong and that students can pay back their loans. Uh, w with that in mind, one proposal that has been discussed and has been uh, put, put out there um, is that of risk sharing with institutions when we're talking about accountability, that they would have some skin in the game and take on some of this risk. And Purdue, within I think a program or two, has, has uh, been a part of this mm -hmm. grand experiment to see how this might work. And I, I think what you just hit upon as far as degree program and expected returns plays a large role in this. But um, what do you think about this Purdue experiment and the whole general idea of risk sharing and what challenges it might pose moving forward? So I don't know if everyone is familiar. Purdue has a program that um, we, we have income sharing. So our students come into a contract to pay down their student debts based on their income over time. And that's that amount that they pay depends on the degree they take. So for example, if I use the nursing and uh, medical assisting example, nurses would pay back more in dollars than medical assistants would, but proportionately it would be dependent on how much they brought in in terms of their income over time. We've had great success with it, and we really encourage the federal government to look into plans like this and make them more possible for, uh, for institutions across the, across the United States. We think that sharing risk between the institution, the student, and society is really, really important. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, Tiffany, just, just following up on this, um, when we think about this risk sharing and skin in the game in terms mm -hmm. of our underrepresented students and, and looking at it th through an equity lens, um, how, how, how might we view this through an equity lens and what might be the impact on low resource institutions when we think about this? Sure. Um, and so risk sharing is important as a concept, I think, because we have to have a conversation about what happens to these students who struggle to repay their loans. Um, but I think from you know a couple of concerns, one already raised by Betty is the concern that institutions may respond to such a system by reducing access for low-income students, students of color, those who they perceive as uh, facing most difficulty repaying their loans, and we wouldn't want to implement a system that would limit their access. Also concern about this uh, kind of singular focus on whether or not students are able to repay their loans as a metric of success um, in higher ed. And so whatever that system looks like has to go beyond that. It has to also take into account who the institutions are serving, also provide rewards and incentives for actually enrolling and graduating low-income students and students of color. Um, but then when you think about kind of the risk sharing system, I want to say a couple things because a lot of times folks will say, well, we can account for that in that system by doing some sort of risk adjustment. And I think there are just a couple of things to keep in mind as we approach conversations around, well, how would you do that and what's the most effective way? One, I want us to think really hard about what it is we're adjusting for. There's nothing wrong with these students. They are not risky. Um, our systems are, in fact, uh, risky, and we have made choices that systemically disadvantage certain students rather than others. And so I think that part is really, really important because sometimes we can have conversations. We say, well, well, these institutions are serving students who are harder to educate. They're not. The things that they need in terms of food, shelter, child care, transportation are the things that all students need. Some students have been positioned where they can pay out of pocket privately, and some students can. Um, and so as we're thinking about how to design a system where we're holding institutions accountable for serving those students well, we are adjusting for our own inequities uh, as a system and not because there's something wrong with those students or they're at risk. Um, but just a couple things to keep in mind around how would you design a system that actually takes in those things into account. I think you have to talk about peer groups um, and compare similar institutions one to another. Um, and things we have to look at institutional resources when you are thinking about how do you design those peer groups. I think you also have to think about race and not just income. I think there are examples of risk sharing proposals that have tried to think about equity and have done a nice job trying to think about how do you control uh, for the proportion of low-income students that are enrolled. Um, but also, we have to have conversations around race, especially 
because we're talking about student debt and even things like we know that students who don't complete their college degree are more likely to default on their loans than those uh, that do. Uh, but then even controlling for those factors, we still see great disparities between black and white borrowers, for example. Um, and some of that has to do with our inequities in our higher ed system, that has to do with the racial wealth gap and inequities at large. And so we have to be having those conversations as well as we're trying to figure out how do you approach a risk sharing system and accountability system that actually adjusts for equity. Thank you. Thank you. And Scott, of course, uh, the, the state context is very important and, and the role that uh, states do play is re regarding reforms uh, to an accountability system and structure. Um, one popular um, intervention uh, making the rounds in states now is outcomes-based funding, uh, a, a shifting of some of the funds provided by states from enrollment to certain outcomes metrics, however they might determine is most important. So with your work at Lumina Foundation, uh, how, how effective do you think these systems have, have been? What risks do they pose? And uh, is there any type of a role for the federal government to incent the adoption of OBF programs? Uh, thanks for the question. It's good to kind of be the federalism state guy on the panel. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question, but really quickly, I, uh, HEA in, in, in a lot of times when you're talking within, within the DC centric area, if, if it was a truck with a bumper sticker, it would be, I want to be ESEA when I grow up. Uh, and what more can we kind of lump into this, this, uh, this truck bed to, 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 to make it work differently? And ultimately, if you're looking at it from a state perspective, it's an aid program. It's a big aid program. Um, there are a lot of states in the country that have aid programs. They have really big aid programs. So what I would encourage first and foremost is to look at those states that have really good programs, California, Washington, Indiana, others, that are, that are, that are really getting at, at, at some of the issues we've been discussing, especially the issues Tiffany brings up. Um, and then secondly, look at the states that have really inequitable aid programs. Um, and we won't name those, but um, we'll be glad to provide that information at a later date. Uh, the ultimately, policies, programs, institutions um, that are not developed with equity as a central feature ultimately over time yield inequitable outcomes. If you look at health care policy, if you look at uh, criminal justice policy, you look at education policy and the results that ultimately lead to then those, those programs going sideways uh, in a lot of cases for certain um, racial and ethnic groups is because of their design being much more macro and not focused on, on turning around those results for those populations. Uh, when we look at things like funding formulas, like outcomes-based funding and others, um, that is a constellation or an elemental issue within states um, that drives funding policy. Ultimately, the ones that Lumina looks at and sh says there's evidence here that shows that it is moving in the right direction are those that are fundamentally based in an issue of equity. And, and, and the, in, the signaling to institutions that, that resources are going to be provided to support um, students of color, low-income students, and the success of those students. And that drives resources to those institutions that serve those students better. Um, and that serve more of those students. The inequity can come when those programs are not designed that way and continue to, to foster that. But as that part of the constellation of not really accountability, but a constellation of, of, of an ecosystem that's successful around serving all different kind of student groups, um, funding formulas that incentivize equity and incentivize closing of equity gaps um, states setting goals, states using data that is, that is driven, that's disaggregated, um, states that, that drive their financial aid programs towards low-income students and students of color, um, create a constellation and an environment by which students can be successful. I would encourage everyone to look at states that are moving in this direction, look at the research around this, um, and, and find opportunities to, to collaborate with states and to pick up those best practices. Absolutely, and so, some, there's a lot of research yet to be done, but some of the early research around that does show that those models focused on equity do, do tend to have some of the better outcomes that we see. Um, are there any other state accountability reforms out there in the landscape right now that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, one in particular. We, we, um, we've been working with a couple of states in what we call talent innovation equity, and these states, uh, Tennessee and Colorado, 
um, both of which have challenging um, situations and populations. Colorado has one of the highest attainment rates in the country, but one also one of the highest gaps uh, in the country on racial and ethnic minorities. Tennessee is really three states. It's the it's the Delta, it's Appalachia, um, and then um, <clears throat> and then this, um, Middle Tennessee. Uh, both have really kind of embraced all of the, this constellation of policies. Uh, and uh, this, the state, super, state chief, uh, Mike Krause, came forward and said, listen, we've done all this, but we're really not seeing movement on, on, on closing these gaps. And so we provided a little bit of resources um, to those states and said, choose your own adventure. How do you double down on equity? And how do you get increase, set a hard number of increasing the attainment of students of color by 5% over four years. Sounds like a small number, but that's tens of thousands of Tennesseans and Coloradans increasing in attainment. And what we found is that they are more than willing to do that, um, embracing that kind of flexible dollars to, to really embrace different ideas, bring together institutions, communities, employers around this idea of closing gaps and increasing attainment for students of color. Thank you, thank you. Tiffany, I'd like to uh, go back to you for just a minute and, and play off some of your comments from earlier. Uh, we, we got into the discussion about the importance of, of, um, of uh, students with varying levels of preparation and how it's not that they're more difficult to educate, but there's different resources that are needed. So when you think about this in uh, the extent that current federal policy and state accountability systems are sensitive to this issue, do you think they are? Um, and if not, what do you think might need to be changed? Sure. Um, and so to the comments that were made earlier, it's not that I think James gave our federal accountability system a C um, and might be generous in terms of how aggressive it is, but where we actually see accountability policy implemented is more at the state level. Like Scott was already acknowledging, we got over 35 states have some sort of outcomes-based funding policy. Um, but how well do they address these issues around equity? Um, to Scott's point, many of them have recognized you know, equity is important and try to build in some sort of a cent incentive. Um, where we're falling short and where we have to be strengthened then I guess is one um, often these metrics uh, are not given enough weight to counteract the natural incentive to become more selective that is the clearest path forward to win according to the formulas too often so it takes considerable effort to try to counteract uh, that natural inclination to say all I need to do is change the student that I admit rather than um, do something different also uh, institutions uh, because our funding formulas pre outcomes based funding were inequitable um, and often favored uh, wealthier campuses that served wealthier students we often don't provide a set of resources for campuses to have a path forward to implement the types of practices that uh, we've seen based on the research would have an impact on outcomes mm -hmm. And so without an, a huge investment in capacity building and the implementation of evidence-based practices, um, and then alongside that, not necessarily rewarding uh, you know, equity and equity in terms of low in, not only low-income students, but we often see many states for a number, like it's been said, there's a lot of different political contexts across the country. Um, so some states uh, include race, some don't. Um, and so in some cases, you even see equity metrics having an impact where you see gains for low-income students uh, and you might see decreases for black students in the same uh, set of institutions because of wh what, how the incentives have been set up. Um, and so I think we have to have some harder conversations around how exactly do you uh, design these metrics? How do you ensure they have enough weight to counteract the natural inclination to become more selective? And then also, how do you actually create a path forward for institutions we want? to improve because the accountability system should not be about closing down campuses. Um, we want to provide more access and opportunity to higher education. We just want to see better results. Um, and so we have to talk about strategic investments. And one thing I'll say, because often you make that point, folks say, well, where are you going to get this money from? <laughs> uh, and so we have to be thoughtful about the money we are already allocating to higher ed. Um, Kat did, uh, the Center for American Progress did a great analysis uh, earlier this year where they looked at spending uh, by race. and and their conclusion was we're about a $2,000 gap between what we spend on white students and hired versus black students. And that's about the cost of uh, implementing something like the CUNY ASAP model where we, the evidence suggests that it actually moves the needle on completion, but often the response is, well, all institutions don't have resources to scale that type of program. Um, but it may be a matter of really taking a step back and looking at how we allocate those resources in the first place and trying to close those equity gaps. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
James, uh, back to you. Uh, right now, two big topics are the 90-10 rule and gainful employment. And th there are, seem to be some efforts uh, by the current administration and others to, to perhaps roll these back. And uh, I, I know that you, you were a, an important piece in, in uh, putting them into place under, under the former administration. And so c could you uh, just briefly tell us what the 90-10 rule is, as well as uh, why gainful employment is important, and uh, you, you, you're taking why uh, there's an effort to roll these back um, and, and get kind of our, our landscape around that right now. Yes, um, but before I do, I have a thought on the equity conversation sure, that I think might be helpful. And I do agree that uh, I think equity needs to be the first question you ask about any type of accountability mechanism. I think it is worth distinguishing between efforts to set a minimum floor or gatekeeping mm -hmm. in efforts that intend to drive continuous improvement. So, you know, gainful employment, whether you agree with it or not, and I'd be surprised if everyone on the commission agrees with it, but the idea was you set a standard where debt is not affordable for students. And if you do that right, I mean, first of all, you do want to ask what are the implications based on different demographics, and we found that um, Students of color, low-income students have plenty of choices that pay off for them under the standard. Um, but to the extent that you've identified a challenge there, the answer is not to give them loans that they can't, to give students of color disproportionately loans they can't afford to repay. The answer may be our system relies too heavily on debt. Um, so you need to think about equity a little bit differently there. Um, when you talk about outcome-based funding or a lot of the state efforts, those efforts are about trying to improve institutions' outcomes over time, improve their graduation rates, improve, improve their employment outcomes. Um, that is a different equity conversation where you need to be much more inclusive about how you're going to get students from where they are. And I would just you know, offer from having worked on um, President Obama's college trading scheme and the college scorecard that you really need to be sensitive to the many different missions that colleges and universities have. And so there are schools that have very, you know, that look very poor on average earnings because they are liberal arts colleges or they are rabbinical schools. They are very good at what they are trying to do. There are schools at the top of the US news rankings. I would be thrilled if my nieces and nephews went to some of those schools, but they are very expensive. They are not very inclusive. And then you have the institutions that are trying to serve their communities often much more affordable, sometimes those are the ones that are really generating the middle class. Those are the ones that are really responsible for upward mobility in our country. And those often get overlooked in the focus on the very elite, very expensive. So I think to the extent the commission is thinking broadly about accountability, it needs to be sensitive both to the distinction between eligibility and efforts to promote improvement and to the different missions that colleges have. Um, I'm afraid I blew most of my time. I will say quickly that um, you know the idea behind the 90-10 rule is um, a market-based mechanism to test the value of programs that are supported by federal financial aid. And the idea is, are there at least 10% of students who are willing to pay for this program out of pocket? So in other words, you know, if you set aside the federal subsidies, the Pell Grants, and the loans, is, it, is someone actually willing to worth, is it worth the money for someone? And um, there is a debate about um, the, uh, the rule now. I think it is important to make sure that we are moving in the direction of strengthening accountability standards um, because we do, need, we do not have the assurance um, that we need that students are going to get value out of the loans they borrow and the taxpayers will get value out of Pell Grants. Uh, and, and just briefly in closing before we open it up to the audience, so one topic of discussion, there's been bipartisan support for a College Transparency Act around uh, different points of data and maybe looking at the programmatic level versus the institutional level. Uh, Betty, for, from your perspective, being uh, on a campus um, in, in your capacity, um, what is the difference between looking at data between the programmatic and institutional level and, and the rationale for putting these data out there? So. You know, institutional level, everybody at the university gets put into a, one bucket, and the university has an outcome as a consequence of that bucket. Uh, at the programmatic level, some institutions have lots of engineers. Some institutions, as James said, have lots of liberal arts people. If those folks are in the same bucket, it turns into 
beige. And when you do something at the programmatic level, it's no longer beige. You're comparing programs with programs, liberal arts with liberal arts, engineering with engineering. It seems to us that that makes much more sense because it is at the programmatic level that students are learning and that students are growing. And um, there are institutions that have some programs that are great and at the same institution, other programs that are not as great. So by doing things at the programmatic level where students learn, you have a much better sense of what makes sense for that program within that institution. I don't okay. know if that clarifies, but that's certainly, I think, the fairest way to compare, taking into consideration, of course, the uh, access policies of the institution at the same time. We, we have to say that every time, and we want to talk about access. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thanks to each of you, and with that, I would like to turn it over to you all in the audience and uh, see if we have any questions or any areas that we haven't hit on that you would like to discuss. Yes, right here. Um, for the moment, I just have a question of how we got here. Uh, how we got here uh, in the first place. When I went to Michigan, the state support for education was much better. My first semester, I paid seventy-five dollars in tuition. <laughs> Anybody want to take this one? <laughs> the University of Michigan is constitutionally autonomous. <laughs> it was created the same day the legislature was. So, right. Yeah. It's. And I don't have an I, answer. Yeah. Go ahead. The only thing I would add is that we're in a moment now where higher education is and having some sort of post-secondary opportunity is even more crucial to students being able to find a job. Um, and it's in this moment that we're having a conversation about how to fix our debt-based system. Um, and so I think it is refreshing to have these conversations with in mind that there was a time when it wasn't this expensive because when we try to have these conversations about whether it be free college or some other type of approach or debt free college there is this perception of like that's ridiculous as a concept as if higher ed has always been this debt based system and it wasn't especially when it was more exclusive so. I, I would make two observations that I think are at least part of it one is um, when there's a recession and states need to balance their budgets as revenues drop, uh, it is seen as easier to cut higher education funding than to cut health care or to cut K-12 funding. There's an idea that colleges and universities can absorb it, they can raise tuition, but then when the budgets come back, the money gets spread around, and so the net effect over time is that per student funding is ratcheted down. Um, the other, you know, and I think Tiffany hit it on this, student loans have no cost to the federal government. We've structured it now so that they are essentially break-even propositions, um, which um, means that more student debt is um, an easy answer for federal policymakers, state policymakers, colleges. And we have not paid enough attention until recently to the minority of students for whom that debt seems to be too much. Yeah, and, and uh you know, one thing we advocate for at SHEO is more comprehensive conversations within states between the state SHEOs, the legislature, and the governor's office are around um, aff affordability and what is affordability. And, and as James just mentioned, when, when we hit recessions, higher education is seen as an area that can raise its own revenue, unlike other departments within state government. And so often they're, they're given that latitude as uh, state resources going into these programs drop. What we need to have are conversations around what are state goals regarding the balance of, of what's going to be state support, um, what's going to be come from maybe private entities um, as we're responsive to workforce needs versus tuition versus uh, need-based aid. And when these get out of kilter due to recessions and other bumps in the road, that we strive to get back to this balance instead of making political hay out of, out of uh, you know, higher education and how expensive it is and these types of things. But we can work together as a team and as a group. Uh, Washington State recently did this during the most recent recession that they let institutions increase uh, their uh, tuition rates by double digits in some case. But when the economy recovered, tuitions uh, levels went back down, which you rarely ever see, and the state support went up. And those are the types of concerted conversations that I think we need to have. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, right back here. Uh, Frank Ballman, Jazz Gallant, State Superintendent Programs. Is all the panelists know there's... Oh, thank you. Uh, there's... No, 
a great majority of states have performance funding or outcomes metrics, but as we also know, states realize unintended consequences or failed metrics almost immediately and revise them continuously. Given that uh, Congress is not nearly as nimble now as it was when we had uh, Chairs Miller and McKeon, how, how, uh, how would you address the idea that if Congress only passed reauthorization every 10 plus years, how do you build in some adaptability into the accountability metrics that would uh, ensure we don't have unintended consequences? Because if you look at it, the big accountability metric we have today is cohort to fall rate, and that's really a result of a problem from the late 80s and early 90s, and still we have it today, and there's all sorts of workarounds with forbearances, things like that that make cohort to fall rate meaningless. So. Can, I'd, I'd like to, to comment a little bit. One of the challenges we have is that higher education, by its nature, moves very slowly. Graduation rate takes six years to mature. So if you say today we're going to focus on grad rate, in six years you'll see if you made any difference, if you take it at the outside edge. Things like cohort default rate also take a long time to mature because students are in school for a long time. One of the challenges we face is if we keep changing the measures, because this week or this month or this year, that seems like a good measure, and we don't hang on to the old ones, we'll never know how we're doing and what we're doing. Part of the challenge is that education takes longer than the next political cycle, and 10 years seems like it's not a long, long, long time, but education is also slow. Now you could say, well, let's have shorter education, and there is a conversation worthy there, but right. that's one of the reasons we have such a hard time with accountability. You can't tell next week whether or not you're doing a good job today. I would just add you can build that into the process as well. I think Tennessee is an example of that, um, and they've had one of the longest uh, outcomes-based funding um, system and they have a, a, a process that's built in that they're going to in 2019, I believe, because it's every maybe three years, uh, where they uh, convene folks and have a conversation around adjustments and they make adjustments. From a research perspective, that can be very challenging because uh, you can't have your treatment changing <laughs> if you want to study impact. Um, but from a very practical perspective, um, it does create an opportunity that's built into the process to revisit and redesign the formula. And I would imagine that that would be very important to do at the federal level. And the only thing I would add is just making sure that in that conversation, we're being inclusive and thinking about uh, campus leaders and students and all, some of these other voices that don't always have a seat at the table when trying to design uh, what this high, that system looks looks like. Thank you, Tiffany. Any other questions? Yes, Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Cooper with the Institute for Higher Education Policy. And Rob, I really appreciated your example um, where you talked about, you know, incorporating state policy and, uh, I mean, tuition policy into these conversations. And one thing I noticed is that whenever we're talking about accountability, we very rarely talk about tuition. We talk about student loans, we talk about financial aid, but we don't talk about the actual costs that have an impact in some ways on what students end up having to do related to financial aid. And I'm just wondering if you all could speak to how do we go about incorporating conversations about tuition policy more into this whole d discussion about higher education accountability? Because right now, as you all know, higher education is becoming more of a necessity Tuition has priced it at the point of a luxury item, and the outcomes are at best mediocre. Anyone? I, I think, you know, tuition, I keep saying, well, it's hard, and I apologize because it is hard. Um, tuition is difficult to measure because some institutions, everybody's got a rack rate, and nobody charges the rack rate. And I think what's important is uh, the return on educational investment, the cost of an education to an individual. That's something that is measurable and is very important for legislators and policymakers to think about. But that depends in part on things like transfer credit policies, on what kind of experiential learning a student can bring into the classroom. And that varies very much between 18 to 22 year olds and someone who's going back to school after having been in the workforce for a decade, someone who comes from the military who has transferable skills that can be counted against 
credits towards a degree. So I'm in full favor of talking about tuition as long as that tuition is not some number on a marketing page, but is how much students pay for the degrees at that university, given where they come from. Yes, yeah, Scott. And Michelle, I think we, we've been working with, with, with states to really think about comprehensively their, their talent financing. So not just their general revenue appropriation or their federal dollars or their state aid dollars, but to think of them all as a comprehensive package. And, and then when you start to think about tuition, you can see how much it contributes to getting to your talent goal in the state. But the other thing it does is that it raises then the, the, the corollary question, the adjacent question of how do you support students that, that are otherwise eligible for other types of federal programs? So supplemental tr nutrition, housing credits, and things like that. And a lot of our post-secondary institutions aren't really built to be those one-stop centers to, to, to provide that. And more and more, if we could um, direct or shape institutional eligibility around the ability to make sure that if a student, a resident of a state, is if they are eligible for these programs, that they are that they are able to receive those programs and as they're in there. So even though tuition is something that we want to we want to do it, that the cost of the total cost of education is something that that we can work a lot more collaboratively with the federal government and our states and our institutions to make sure that those students receive those those like they would if they were not uh, a, a student enrolled on the campus. Thank you. I believe we have time for one more question. Uh, Steve Crawford, UW Institute of Public Policy. <coughs> Quick question uh, to those of you involved in policy making, include, including at the uh, Domestic Policy Council in the days that you were there, James. The, uh, the big elephant in the room is uh, $150 billion of federal student aid plus a lot of state aid, but we do nothing to tie that aid to, and we don't, we don't underwrite it, right? We don't say the way we do to housing for housing loans. Uh, will only loan you as much as that seems worth, your house seems worth. So we send no signals to students that you can only borrow so much or at only such an interest rate if you are going to pursue a program that folks like you seem to succeed in and go, a, go on and get a job that allows you to repay your loan. Has that ever been discussed in policymaking circles at the state or, or federal level? Uh, trying to introduce some underwriting principles into the student loan system? Well, well I think you could look at um, the gainful employment rule as, I, w I don't know that I would call it underwriting, but it's a step in the direction of what you're suggesting. And so what the gainful employment rule does is it looks at occupational career education programs and says, what does the typical graduate earn? And we get that information from Social Security um, and what does a typical graduate owe? And we get that information from the college. And requires that typical graduate's debt must be reasonable in relation to their expected earnings. <laughs> and um, you know, we have seen um, you know, over time um, a positive impact from that rule, in my opinion. You've seen a lot of colleges um, closed programs that couldn't meet that standard and students find better choices. But you also saw colleges introduce scholarship programs, introduce free orientation periods, um, reduce the length of the program when that would increase um, value. Um, so that um, rule now is um, open for debate and the, um, the current leadership at the Department of Education is um, reconsidering it. Um, and I think, you know, they raise a lot of questions about um, whether the measurement is precisely correct or um, you know, are there circumstances where you would want to excuse a student being unable to afford those loans. Um, and um, you know, I, I just think it is um, you know, really unfortunate to abandon this principle that we want to extend loans to places that um, we expect students to be able to repay them. We don't want to be routinely making loans that, um, that students aren't going to be able to afford. The, the, only, the only caution I have with that, and it triggered me, and it is when you said folks like you. And what my concern about someone who's done K-12 policy most of my life is that the folks like you 
not from the institutional perspective, but the individual student perspective, tend to be poor black and brown, and we're guiding them to pathways that, that do not yield as a, a, a family sustaining wage and things like that. So I think we just need to be cautious about making sure that we're, we're again, focusing on issues around equity as we're moving resources and pointing people towards programs that ultimately they can be successful in. Thank you, Scott. And on that note, the red light tells me that our time is up. So won't you please join me in thanking our wonderful panel.